Molt bon dia a tothom. Moltíssimes gràcies per ser aquí, per acompanyar-nos en aquesta sessió tan especial per nosaltres. Avui sou un grup de 300 joves de tota la ciutat que ens acompanyeu en aquesta sessió sobre gènere amb Judith Butler i Miquel Misser. La conferència d'avui s'emmarca en una línia més àmplia del CCCB, que fa temps que estem impulsant de conferències amb joves, amb adolescents de tota la ciutat, que hem anat fent de forma experimental i sense explicar-ho massa, i que últimament estem integrant ja directament a la nostra programació pública del CCCB, perquè pensem que és una experiència molt interessant per nosaltres i també entenem que per les escoles a les quals pertanyeu. Per nosaltres, l'objectiu principal d'aquestes accions és tendir ponts entre el món de la cultura i el món de l'educació, que sovint treballen una mica de d'esquena, i perquè nosaltres pensem que els centres culturals com el nostre són centres essencialment educatius. Són llocs de formació, llocs d'aprenentatge i llocs de descoberta, i que, per tant, tenim moltes coses en comú amb les escoles. Quan nosaltres ens imaginem el futur, pensem que treballar amb escoles, treballar amb adolescents, treballar amb joves com nosaltres, com vosaltres, és d'alguna manera completar la nostra tasca educativa, és ens ajudeu a repensar, a repensar-nos com a institucions culturals i és una manera també per nosaltres d'estar més arrelats a la ciutat i a l'entorn al qual pertanyem. Per tant, d'alguna manera, treballar amb vosaltres és la millor manera per nosaltres d'imaginar el futur, treballar amb gent jove com vosaltres. Per tant, d'alguna manera, el que volem dir-vos és que el CSB és casa vostra, és un lloc on volem que vingueu més sovint, volem que vingueu a un lloc, és un lloc per descobrir, per aprendre, per experimentar i també, per què no, per divertir-vos. Avui tenim el luxe de tenir a Judith Butler entre nosaltres. Judith Butler és una catedràtica de la Universitat de Berkeley a Califòrnia. Ella és una de les grans expertes en temes de gènere, que és el tema que treballarem avui. L'última vegada que va venir al CSCB fa tres anys, ens va explicar de passada que estava adaptant la seva gran obra sobre gender travel per gent jove i per nens i ens vam quedar amb aquesta idea i tres anys després li hem proposat que després de la conferència pública que va fer ahir ens vingués a compartir amb tots vosaltres aquestes reflexions. Per fer-ho, li hem demanat al Miquel Misser, que és un sociòleg i activista trans, que ens acompanyi i que ens ajudi a conduir la conversa. I amb ells dos us deixo la sessió. Gràcies. Molt bon dia a tots i totes. Com esteu? Contents? Heu saltat classe? Heu vingut aquí? Bé, no? Si podeu aplaudir, que us encanta saltar-vos classe, no ens enganyeu. Bé, no és exactament saltar-se classe. Avui pensarem bastant, però d'una manera més amable. Bé, abans que res, donar-vos les gràcies a tots i totes per estar aquí. També als professors i professores que han insistit molt per convèncer els seus centres educatius que era fonamental estar aquí. No sé si sabeu, però hi ha molts instituts que volien venir i s'han quedat fora, així que la gent que esteu aquí sou molt, molt privilegiada. També gràcies al CSCB per obrir aquests espais i, com deia la Judit, entre la cultura i l'educació. I, sobretot, gràcies a la Judit Butler, que, a diferència de moltes persones que es dediquen a pensar, ella està convençuda que és molt important pensar també en relació i pensar també en la gent jove, no? Pensar què penseu vosaltres de totes aquestes idees que s'estan desenvolupant. Per tant, bueno, realment moltíssimes gràcies per acceptar aquesta invitació en aquest diàleg. Tot i que possiblement ja la coneixeu o l'heu treballat a classe o l'heu vist a Marlí, alguna d'aquestes, bueno, la presentaré com molt ràpidament. Doncs sí, efectivament és una filòsofa nord-americana que treballa a la Universitat de Berkeley, a Califòrnia, i té una obra molt, molt extensa de més de deu llibres que avui no ens aprofundirem molt, però que han sigut molt, molt importants en el desenvolupament del pensament feminista, de les idees entorn al gènere. Ella principalment s'ha centrat en pensar per què existeixen els homes i les dones, per què existeix el comportament masculí i femení, d'on ve, d'on no ve... Ha reflexionat també molt al voltant dels gais, les lesbianes i el col·lectiu transsexual. Aquestes són com algunes de les seves idees força. I d'alguna manera, algunes de les idees amb les quals avui pensem aquests temes tenen molt a veure amb aportacions que va fer Judith Butler ara fa pràcticament 20 anys. D'alguna manera això s'ha anat traduint amb altres coses que potser vosaltres quan us les trobeu no fica. Això són idees desenvolupades per Judith Butler, però d'alguna manera ho estan. Llavors avui tenim l'enorme sort de poder discutir i debatre amb una persona que ha reflexionat sobre això i que té segurament moltes coses a dir. 
Pero alhora, també és una persona que està molt interessada per saber què pensen els adolescents i les adolescents sobre aquestes idees. Per tant, ella farà una intervenció bastant, no sé, al voltant dels 20 minuts, probablement, i després obrirem un espai com molt més ampli on vosaltres podreu fer comentaris, reflexions al voltant d'això. Jo us convido molt a que les feu. Segurament hi ha una mica de timidesa al principi, no patiu, tenim la sort de poder tenir espai per fer-ho i m'agradaria que que realment parléssiu i diguéssiu el que us sembla i el que us està generant tot aquest tema. Segurament entre vosaltres hi ha persones que els interessen més o menys els temes de gènere, però hi ha una cosa que és molt evident i és que us interessin més o menys a tota la gent que estem aquí ens atravessen. O sigui, no és una cosa que sigui una cosa exterior a nosaltres, sinó que tota la gent que estem aquí vivim en una societat que espera de nosaltres que siguem homes o dones, hem de ser homes o dones, si no ho som o no ho sabem és una mica complicat, i tot el rato aquesta pregunta se'ns està fent. Quan anem al lavabo hem d'escollir una porta, quan anem a una botiga de roba hem d'escollir una secció, quan hem de fer un regal a una persona que ha acabat de néixer hem de saber el seu sec, o sigui, és una cosa bastant pesada. Per tant, encara que no us apassioni el tema, doncs males notícies perquè us implica directament. I després... També és un tema que té molt a veure, per exemple, amb qui és el líder de la classe. També és un tema que té a veure amb qui lliga més en una classe. També és el tema que té a veure amb qui és en un institut qui rep els insults. Qui és el marica de la classe? Qui és la puta de la classe? I tot això són temes que us trobeu en el quotidià, a les portes dels lavabos, que tenen tota aquesta descripció d'insults i famílies d'insults, que sempre són molt estimulants. Tot això, que és el vostre quotidià, són reflexions que tenen molt a veure amb el pensament que proposa Judith Butler. I alhora ens trobem en un moment bastant interessant on els temes de gènere estan molt, molt presents en el nostre dia a dia. Vosaltres segurament ho constateu, però els temes de gènere tenen a veure amb per què la vaga feminista va tenir l'èxit que va tenir. Espero que aneixeu a la manifestació. Oi, què veu anar? Molt bé. Si no, no ho digueu, perquè quedareu fatal. Vull dir que avui en dia no anar a la vaga feminista és quedar fatal. Això també és una cosa sorprenent. Però també té a veure amb per què Conchita Bust va guanyar Eurovisió, per què Dulceida té tant èxit, per què els triplets, quan fan qualsevol cosa, tothom hi va, per què el nòvio trans de la Marina Operación Triunfo surt allà amb aquella samarreta... Tot això, tots aquests temes que estan tan presents, tenen a veure amb que hi ha hagut molta gent que ha contribuït a poder parlar obertament d'aquests temes. Llavors, bàsicament, la feina que hem de fer és pensar una mica críticament al voltant d'això. I la Judith Butler es dedica a això, es dedica a acompanyar la gent a pensar críticament sobre els temes de gènere. Per tant, jo us convido a que ho feu, a que jugueu al joc, a escoltar-la i també a provocar-la i plantejar-li dilemes i dubtes interessants. Així que endavant. Moltes gràcies. Great. So um, you can hear me, and the translation is working. You've got translation? Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, wonderful. I am really happy to be here, and I'm always happy to be in Barcelona. Um, so I wanted to start today by um, asking you a question. Um, when you were born, what was the very first thing that anyone wanted to know about you? Right? What did they say? You came into the world, what did people want to know? Well, they asked whether you're a boy or a girl. So at that moment in history, you were told, <laughs> effectively, I mean, I don't know what you understood, but um, that there are boys and girls and that you would be one or the other. Um, now, it could have been a doctor or a nurse or some other person who announced your sex, um, uh, but that announcement greeted you as you came into the world. Um, and that question, are you a boy or a girl, that question was waiting for you when you came into the world. It's like, you were born, what did they want to know? Gender, which gender, first thing. Um, or maybe there were tests in advance, and um, the person who gave birth to you um, found out in advance, but it is one of the very first things we learn. Now, um, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that in the beginning of your life, um, none of us come into the world as persons, as simple persons. 
You're not a little infant person. You are, you only become a person, you become recognizable as a person, you can be addressed as a person once your sex is assigned, right? So the sex assignment makes you into a understandable person. Oh, what is it? Is it a boy, is it a girl? Otherwise, we don't know. And if it's not quite a boy or not quite a girl, or if you have ambiguous genitalia, let's say you're intersex, then in fact, their doctors are not always able to answer that question. But okay, so what's what about sex assignment? What do we care? Well, it seems to me that when you're assigned a sex, um, you are also, something is communicated to you, a certain set of expectations about what your life will be like. Oh, it's a girl, great. Let's put a certain color on the girl. Let's imagine the future of the girl. The future of the girl is starting to be imagined at the moment that the infant is called a girl. It's a girl, <gasps> and one's excited. And what is it that excites one? Well, it's the idea of girlness. It's some idea of what it is to become a girl. It's the wondrous life of a girl. Or it's a boy. Oh, it's a boy. You know, that's great. We've got a boy. And we start to imagine the life of the boy. And when we imagine the life of the boy or we imagine the life of the girl, and we are imagining it at the moment that we say it's a boy or a girl, imagining a certain kind of story of what your life is going to be like. And what, does, what, what steps you will take, what you will look like, what you will, what you will sound like, um, uh, what your sexuality will be, what, your marriage, your job, right? There are gendered assumptions about marriage and job, all of those. And these are social. They don't come from whatever biological facts characterize your body. Let's say that that's your sex, okay? And when we assign sex, we're simply naming a bi biological difference that for the most part holds, although there are many exceptions. But the minute we start imagining the social life of the person, that is to say, your life in society, we're talking about your gender, because gender, are the, is the, is, gender can be defined as the social meanings that sex assumes in a life, right? It's one thing to be born with certain primary sexual characteristics, but that doesn't say who you're going to love. It doesn't say what you're going to look like. It doesn't even say anything about how you will feel about having that body, and neither will it tell you anything about whether you will be married or what kind of job you will have or whether you will want to stay with that sex assignment. Because we're always assigned to sex by others, and their expectations also come through that assignment. So people are imagining our future way in advance of our being able to imagine our own future. Somebody else is imagining your gendered life way in advance of you being able to imagine your own gendered life. So as one moves into Mm, adolescence, as one moves into one's own life, you see that there are more choices that you have. Uh, what are the expectations that have been communicated to me? Do I accept them? Do I reject them? Do I want to revise them? Maybe I love them. Maybe I'm really happy. Maybe um, I was named a girl, and I love being a girl, and I don't feel any conflict at all about being a girl. That's not me, by the way, but there are people who say that, and you know, I say, good, have a great gendered life, right? I was named a boy, I was named a boy, they imagined me as a boy, and I'm living out their fantasy of what kind of boy I would be, and I'm actually liking being in their fantasy about who I am. That's a good life for me, I'm happy, good. You don't have to be suffering with gender norms. Unfortunately, many people do, and that suffering can take different forms. Sometimes it's simple, uh, ambivalence. Uh, I want to be accepted. I want to look a certain way. I don't want people to see another side of me that doesn't really conform with being a girl or doesn't really conform with being a boy. So I have to suppress that side of me in order to be acceptable. 
But sometimes um, the entire idea of being a girl is not okay if you are if you are assigned to be a girl. It's not okay, and one really wants to uh, to change. One wants to be free to choose another sex assignment. You can go to the law. You can you can make a petition, and you can in fact change it if that's what you want and that's what you feel you need in order to lead a better life for yourself. Most places allow you to do that. Sometimes there are complicated processes, but some people need to do that. Some, some of us, like me, um, I don't need to change my sex because I'm, I'm always between um, these categories. I've never fully understood them. Um, uh, I, I live at a certain distance from them, but I also know that they inhabit me because I belong to society too. Um, uh, but I, I make my way uh, between the categories or maybe with a little bit of each or it changes as I grow older. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not completely at ease. Um, now, um, it seems to me that the most important thing people can do who are not at ease with um, the way they've been assigned to live out uh, gender in this life is, um, is to find their own zone of freedom. What can I do to make this my own? How can I live in my body or how can I present myself in the world um, so that I can breathe more easily, I can move more easily, I feel greater uh, pleasure in my body or in myself or in my way of living in the world. It's amazing to me if you think about it that if a boy walks a certain way and it's considered feminine, he will be teased by other boys. Why? Why is that? Well, the other boys have anxiety because that one boy has departed from what we would call gender norms. He's not acting in the way that boys are supposed to act. Now, if that's true, if that boy can, can walk maybe in a feminine way, if he can decide to wear a dress, if he can do whatever he wants to do with his clothes. He's brave, by the way. Um, uh, maybe that means that other boys could do that too, that there's nothing fixed or natural about our gender identity. It's, 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 a, it's a pathway that we find. It's a pathway that's given to us. It's part of what is assigned to us. But as we move along that path, we can take our own paths or move, oh, we can move to the side or in ways that are better for us. Um, but it's true that I think sometimes um, we do become frightened when people depart from the gender norms. Uh, we're afraid that they will be punished or they will be ridiculed or ostracized, or maybe we're we tend to do it ourselves. We ridicule them or ostracize them as well. And it's because there's an anxiety. What is that anxiety? Well, the anxiety is that there's more freedom to decide your path with gender than any of us are taught. Okay, and I, it doesn't matter what your religious background is. It doesn't matter what your political background is. Nobody is taught, you know, welcome to the world. You are free to pursue your own gender path. I mean, maybe, maybe there are families now that say that. <laughs> that you know, it's true, there are some. But it's, we're, we're not, we don't think of gender as a space of freedom. And of course, we are constrained by norms and, um, and we're affected by society in all kinds of ways. Some of us don't want to depart from those norms, maybe from fear. Some of us like those norms, right? really like those norms and living in the norms. Or, and some of us feel like, I like the norm. I like the norm of being that other sex. I just don't want to be in this sex. I just want to be able to move over and, and live out my life in that other sex. So, um, so this, is, um, this is a complex terrain. And I wonder uh, whether, as we think about it, and we think about uh, homophobia and transphobia, we think about the kinds of um, uh, insults and discrimination and violence that lesbian, gay, bisexual, uh, non-gender conforming and trans people receive in this world. Um, what are the roots of that violence and how can we combat it? Because even if you don't 
experience your own gender as an issue that needs to be kind of thought about or, um, and maybe you don't have forms of gender suffering as you're living in this world as it's currently structured, you still probably want to live in a world in which violence against people on the basis of their gender, which includes women, are the basis of their gender presentation, the basis of their sexual orientation, the, the basis of their sexuality, where that violence is, um, is opposed, is, 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 is considered not acceptable. So um, we all have a role to play in making this world a place where people suffer less with the complexity of who they are and where violence is, um, and violence and discrimination and insult is, is brought down to a minimum. Um, okay, uh, I think maybe I'll just stop there for a moment and see where we are, see if there's some questions or if Mikhail wants to talk. Would you like to tell us about um, about your story? Vale, at that. Bueno, m'ha agradat molt moltes de les coses que que has plantejat sobre tot aquesta última que diu, bueno, encara que tu no siguis una persona que tinguis una especial diversitat de gènere o sexual, segurament ets una persona que vol viure en un món on no hi ha aquestes violències, no? I això segurament és compartit per per molta d'aquesta gent. I també m'ha agradat molt quan has dit que, bueno, que nosaltres quan hem arribat aquí, en aquest món, totes les persones que estem aquí, s'esperava de nosaltres que fóssim homes o dones. I realment, jo em pregunto també a vosaltres què us sembla, no? Perquè tant que parlem de la llibertat i tot això, suposo que us feu càrrec de que en relació al vostre gènere heu sigut francament poc lliures i espero que això us revolti i us reveli i us enfadi, no? Perquè vosaltres no heu triat res en relació a aquest tema. Probablement amb els anys heu anat adaptant-vos, però heu tingut molt poca llibertat, com, com nosaltres, no? I després doncs, això s'ha anat, anat fent. En la meva història de vida, que he tingut bueno, bastantes complicacions amb els temes de gènere, jo vaig néixer com una noia i a l'institut vaig decidir començar a viure com un noi. I, i durant molt de temps doncs, tot el tema era no vull ser una noia, vull ser un noi, ara sóc un noi, vull que la gent em reconegui com un noi. I ara que ja han passat uns anys, doncs, em passa una mica que, que ja una mica no és tan important i que ja tampoc no sé si sóc exactament un noi. Bueno, no ho sé, no? O sigui, que ja m'he anat allunyant dels dos conceptes. What's a full boy? What's a full boy? No està clar, en tot cas, és una, és una molt bona pregunta. It's never clear, it's never clear. Per ningú. Llavors... Bueno, la, la qüestió és que jo també em pregunto no, okay, quin sentit té seguir fent aquest, aquesta cosa com de que sóc un noi, si tampoc ho tinc clar, i després penso, però si la majoria de la gent que també té aquests dubtes tampoc ho diu, doncs clar, no em quedaré jo sola aquí dient és que ja no ho sé. Llavors també em pregunto per què l'altra gent continua fent veure que és un noi o una noia, no? Per què tothom participa d'això? I, I a mi em genera una mica d'angoixa, llavors jo doncs, faig com els altres i sóc un noi, sí, sí, cap problema. Però la realitat és que em sento una mica allunyat d'això. I, i, I em preocupa que tothom sostingui la pel·lícula. Em preocupa que, bueno, que la gent digui, doncs, saps què, que és veritat, que jo tampoc sé si sóc un noi o una noia. És que m'és igual, no? I, I tot i que entre la gent jove comença a venir molta gent que diu doncs, jo sóc gènere no binari, jo sóc gènere neutre, jo no m'interessa, cosa que m'alegra molt, encara és una minoria. Llavors, bueno, no sé tu com, com, què et genera, no? Com podríem fer perquè tothom participés una mica, es contagiés de dir, bueno, és que és igual, no és tan important. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it's funny because some people ask me, do you want to live in a world in which gender categories disappear? And, um, and I don't actually want to live in that world, even though I know that there are some individuals who say, I'm not a boy, I'm not a girl, I'm, I'm non-binary, I'm non-binary, I don't like either category, I make my own way. Um, call me this person, use this pronoun, and that's really important for them. But do I think the world should be without any gender? Well, no, and one of the problems is, is that some people really enjoy their gender. They really enjoy their gender. They love being a girl, they love being a boy, or they take great pleasure in it, and they're actually at peace with it. But even the person who's at peace with it is always somewhere asking the question, Uh, what is expected of me as a boy? What is expected of me as a girl? And there's always that 
ideal or that standard that's kind of up there, it belongs to society, and yet it has its effect on me, and we never quite achieve it. We never know if we've achieved it, and we never quite achieve it because it's a kind of ideal standard that um, that is that is um, uh, that makes us all feel like like we're maybe not quite the real girl or we're not quite the real guy. Um, I also think um, uh, that some people live in fear of um, of losing their gender. Like if I'm a guy and um, I want to go dancing in certain ways, or I want to love another guy. Uh, will I lose my masculinity? Will I lose my gender? Uh, will it diminish? Or girls also, when they do very intense physical sports, or they decide to take on jobs, will I lose my femininity if I do that work, or if I become that strong? So there are these internal um, limits, we might say, that people carry, like, will I become monstrous? Will I become unfeminine or unmasculine if I act in certain ways? Um, I think that's especially true with boys and their ability to be intimate with each other. Um, you know, I think, like, when you're three and four, your boys are hugging each other really intensely, and then there's a point where, like, you don't hug. <laughs> and then maybe you start to hug again, but, like, uh, later, but there's a point where you just don't hug. Right, because that's just too gay, and you have to. And you see how tight you get when you're like, don't want to be gay. <laughs> I'm not gay. I don't hug. Right? I mean, it could be. And girls too. It's like, you know, they they fuss on how each other looks, da, 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 but they don't, you know. But 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 the physicality, like, they they work it out in their own kind of way. We you know we look at how each other looks. Anyway, sorry, I'm off the topic. No, no, no. <laughs> Yo también tenía ganas de que parlesis de... Yo me imagino que entre la gente que ha vingut avui y debe haber gente que está tan en molt bé el que estás dient porque... porque els hi atravessa, ¿no? Porque de alguna manera pues son personas que els seus instituts pues tenen expressions de gènere o sexualitats que no són les de la majoria i no ho viuen molt bé. Llavors jo em preguntava tu, aquesta gent que està aquí segur, que, que viu amb dificultat o amb, amb soledat, ser una mica diferent a la majoria i que té la sort d'estar aquí avui en dia parlant d'això amb el seu institut, quin missatge li, li llançaries? Well, um, my first message would be to make a group. <laughs> make a group of people who can support each other. Right? It can be about gender, it could be about freedom, it can be whatever, whatever it is. But I know in the United States there's a group in almost every high school where kids can go and they can talk about issues. And what's especially important is that you don't have to say, this is who I am or this is what I want. You don't have to know exactly everything about who you are, your gender, your sexuality. You might just be questioning. But a safe space for questioning is a really, really important thing. Um, so that's the first thing I would say. And then I guess I would ask myself whether any of this material is ever taught in the classroom, and how is it taught? And do I like it? Do I not like it? Is it if it's not taught, why is it not taught? Why, why shouldn't we be learning about this, reading stories, looking at films, being able to have an open conversation where people aren't afraid to say what they think and feel, including their fears, including their, their aversion and their, diffi their difficulty. Moltes idees que molts i moltes hauríem de prendre nota sovint. Uh, si us sembla, us convidem ja a incloure's a la conversa. Ja m'anticipo a que només donaré torns de paraula a estudiants, eh, tot i que sé que molta altra gent... Però avui els adults hauran d'escoltar i altra gent parlarà. Per tant, doncs, bueno, si aixequeu la mà serà molt fàcil per la gent que porta els micròfons. No tingueu por. Hem tancat les portes amb clau. Molt bé, aquí tenim una pregunta. Ara, ara et porten un micro. Mandaban. Sí, sí, puedes hacerla en catalán. Eh, 
que yo siempre he estado muy de acuerdo con mi sexo, siempre he pensado que soy una dona y soy una dona y punto. Pero mamá no había pensado que potser podía cambiar o podía, no sé, res del todo, todo está entre mí. Yo creo que me em siento una dona, pero sí que cuando va començar a, a saber el que tú de ellas y cómo pensabas, eh, Sí que em va suprir una mica els ulls en el sentit de que estem molt condicionats que el món espera una cosa de les dones i una cosa de les dones i dels homes i que és així que no podem canviar-ho. Bueno, sí que podem, però és molt difícil. I sí que és veritat que, bueno, per exemple, el meu cusi petit li agrada molt, molt, molt ballar i no vol perquè diu que ningú a la seva classe balla, que que no vol perquè és de noia, és que estarà sol, ella, ella. I llavors a mi sempre he pensat que si és el que a tu t'agradava, el que a ell li agrada, que li encanta, que no sé per què no ho feia. Llavors crec que arribarà un moment en què ho farà, però sempre, ara que has dit això, sí que és veritat que els nois tampoc es donen abraçades, ni petó, ni res, perquè és massa gay i perquè no ho han de fer. I no ho sé. Sí, saps. Well, first of all, let's... Let's... Let's be clear that in different cultures and in different classes, um, Uh, there are very different ideas of what it is to be a woman and what it is to be a man, what it is to be a girl, what it is to be a boy. So, for instance, um, when you travel, or even when I travel here, you know, there are very different modes of presentation. Um, um, and, and certain things would be considered to be girlish in a man um, that in, in the United States that would not be considered girlish here. I mean, you know... Rafael Nadal can, can wear pink tennis shoes. I mean, maybe because he is Rafael Nadal. But it would be very hard to find someone on the American team, the men's team, the tennis team, who would wear pink tennis shoes. And then I think, well, um, Rafa's rather uh, confident about who he is. <laughs> he can wear anything and feel comfortable, right? Because he's not afraid. Um, maybe, of, of appearing this way or that. Um, and I, I also notice he, he's very, uh, he's very um, intimate with his friends. Um, he, he seems to have a relaxed masculinity. Like, um, he's not gay, but he loves his friends, and he, he's, not, he's not so nervous about being gay that he can't hug his friends. <laughs> Sometimes we think, oh, if I do hug, then I am gay and I become gay or something gay in me is suddenly seen. But actually, maybe you're just affectionate with your friend and you can be heterosexual and affectionate with your friend <laughs> and it's okay. Um, um, or, 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 or in, in fact, you know, there are different ways of being a woman, right? There's not one idea of being a woman. And that's one of the things that feminism has made possible in this world. So many young women now look and they see many different options for them. You can still be a woman. You can even still be feminine if that's what you want to be and go into different kinds of work or look a certain way, you know, build a style or have relationships as you wish. Um, but, you know, there is also a conservative... Um, dimension of all of our societies that tells us, no, there are not, there are not many ways of being a woman. Um, so so that's, that's important. Um, I think one question every young woman could ask is, are there things I suppress in myself for fear of seeming masculine or losing my femininity? And there's a question every young man can ask. Are there, are there things in myself or ways that I relate to others that I monitor And I watch really carefully because I'm afraid of losing my uh, status as a man. Well, maybe, maybe what actually needs to happen is that we all live with a little less fear 
and that we all accept that there are even more ways to be a man or be a woman or other categories outside of man or woman or, or whole experiences where you can't say whether they're gendered or not. Maybe a whole way of living in the world that doesn't feel particularly gendered, which maybe doesn't really belong to the category of boy or the category of girl, but that is your own space of freedom, a, a kind of freedom from the categories themselves. Y había algo más que había checado la mano. Allá dal a la izquierda. Hola. Vale, perdón. Bueno, la pregunta es si creieu que el fet de que avui en dia els adolescents no acceptin la, var la variació de gènere és una part culpa de les escoles perquè no ens eduquen directament l'acceptació tant com a orientació sexual com al gènere. Mm. Well, that should, that should probably change. That should probably change. You know, there's a fear about teaching gender in the schools. They're afraid that people like us will come in and will tell you, okay, boys, you need to now start wearing pink ribbons in your hair, or okay, girls, you need to start playing with trucks. No, we don't do that. We don't prescribe, you know, <laughs> to people to what to do or how to change their gender. We're, we don't come into the schools and put makeup on men or take the makeup off the girls. You know, we don't do this. <laughs> we, it, the, the whole point is that there were far too many prescriptions in the world, people telling you how best to live your gender and what it means to be a girl or a boy and, and for you to live up to them. So the whole point is to lift off the pressure of prescriptions, to prescribe less and to accept more. You know, um, when you say that uh, teenagers don't accept gender variation. I, I bet that's not true. I bet that they're accepting gender variation all over the margins and in, in parts of their lives that don't necessarily show up in front of their peers or in the classroom. What the problem is, is that there's not a public or a shared way to talk about different ways that people want to live their genders or are already living their genders within the common spaces, within the classroom, within, within the media, within the, within the public um, um, uh, spaces that you share as teenagers. So I bet, there's, I bet there's more gender variation in this room than any of us would, ex would expect. And what does gender variation even mean? Well, it just means that there are certain things you want or feel, uh, they might even be in your dreams or your fantasies, that you don't feel comfortable sharing with others because you know that would not be acceptable, right? It wouldn't conform, and people might think you're this way, or they might think you're this way. And conformity is really big among teenagers. Everybody fears the loss of conformity. But some people find freedom in not conforming. And freedom is a re really exhilarating value. It's a really important value. Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> Going on and on. Jo penso que quan, quan dius això de és l'escola culpable de que els adolescents no respectem la variabilitat de gènere, jo també crec que igual no és tan així. Crec que per primer cop els adolescents estan plantejant temes al voltant del gènere i la sexualitat que el propi professorat no entén. I això és una cosa bastant nova, no? O sigui, els conceptes, les paraules que es fan servir, la cultura al voltant del gènere i la sexualitat, molts i moltes adolescents tenen conceptes i saben coses que els seus pares no saben. No saben què vol dir pansexualitat, no saben què vol dir parlar amb gènere neutre, no saben... Bueno, i en canvi molts adolescents sí que ho saben. Jo crec que també els adolescents i les adolescents us podríeu plantejar si vosaltres no podeu portar el vostre institut a canviar la seva perspectiva. Vosaltres també sou una força de gent que està allà, l'institut també sou vosaltres, i per què no apretar una mica també, posar en qüestió algunes coses que no us semblen bé, proposar, escolta, és que em sembla que, bueno, com aquest professor, no?, que, que, va, doncs que va tenir comentaris homòfobs, va fer comentaris homòfobs a la classe, i la gent de l'institut li va fer una manifestació. 
Escolta, per què no, no? Vull dir que vosaltres no només sou el que els professors i les professores fan de vosaltres, vosaltres també feu que els professors i les professores s'hagin de moure. I aquesta és la gràcia, no? Que vosaltres també us sentiu protagonistes de l'escola. No només un lloc on, bueno, i si tot el professorat fos homòfobs, nosaltres també haurem de ser homòfobs? No, vosaltres podríeu anar a l'escola i dir, sabeu què, sou uns homòfobs. Per què no? Llavors, també tenir una idea com més positiva de vosaltres, més empoderadora. Per què no ens plantegem fer l'escola més amable i com? Doncs començarem nosaltres, els alumnes, a començar a reflexionar sobre això. I això en algunes escoles ha passat, en alguns instituts, el professorat ha hagut de formar-se en aquest tema, ha hagut de canviar la seva manera de parlar d'aquests temes perquè el propi alumnat els deia, escolta, és que així ja no. Llavors fem-ho al revés, no és per culpa dels instituts som tenim més discriminació, sinó per culpa dels alumnes un institut haurà de deixar de ser homòfob? Doncs potser sí, i no serà per culpa, sinó que serà gràcies a... Jo crec que això també és una cosa... Vull dir que teniu molt de poder, encara que no ho sentiu així. Teniu poder de fer canviar, a vegades, la línia de com s'explica una cosa a la classe. Feu-lo servir. No sé si han... Sí, és que... Bé, d'acord, molt bé. Hola, bon dia. Abans has fet un comentari sobre que els gèneres no existeixin, que molta gent t'ha dit que seria millor i d'aquesta manera, no? I que també has dit que tu penses que hi ha gent que se sent molt a gust amb el seu gènere. Però, a veure, a mi, per exemple, em passa, com t'ho has explicat, que no et sents com un noi ni com una noia, perquè a vegades és com, però què és ser noi i què és ser noia, el que m'han dictat exactament què és. Per això a vegades no ho arribo a entendre. I penso que seria millor que no existissin els gèneres perquè no hi hauria res que ens dictessi com hem d'actuar segons el gènere home o dona i 26 més que hi ha, que tampoc me'l sé perquè són molts. Però, per exemple, la transfòbia com a tant no existiria perquè no hi ha gènere. Quin seria el problema? Simplement ens diferenciaríem biològicament parlant. Merci. Bueno, gràcies. Well, I would say, I would love to read the science fiction story that you would write of a world without genders. And, you know, there are some novels where there are no pronouns you cannot tell what sex the people are, right? There are a couple of different novels that experiment like that. It's extremely interesting. Um, but, but look, here's the problem. Who would decide to abolish genders, right? Somebody would have to have the authority. Like, would it be the state? Would there be a vote? I mean, you don't need another vote. <laughs> well, maybe you do need another vote. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, little Catalan joke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, but, but here is the biggest, the biggest problem with getting rid of genders. The, 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 big, the biggest problem with getting rid of genders is that somebody would give themselves or some group would give themselves the authority to abolish gender as a category. And then all the people who kind of like gender Right? What about them? They want to be, they would be the radicals, right? They would be, they would become transgressive. It's like, oh, we're not allowed to have a gender, but really, I like being a boy, you know? And they would be, you know, it, it, I think it can't work like that. And in fact, we're formed, you know, it's not just that we're given this assignment, but that assignment is the first moment of being formed. People say, Oh, then you've got a name, you've got a proper name, and then you're brought into the family and you're treated certain ways. You're addressed certain ways, vocally addressed differently. If you're a boy or a girl, you're given different toys, you're, you're, you're oriented towards different pathways in life. So these formations are deep, and they also come with profound psychological implications, right? The, the mother, the father, the, the whole family has certain ideas of who you are and are invested in you in certain ways. And when you start to depart from their idea of who you are, that can be very destabilizing. Will you lose your family? Will you lose your community? Will you be left alone? Would there, will there be a new community of support for you if you decided to take a more radical step for yourself? And, 
And the truth is, um, you know, these are long struggles. We can't just abolish the categories. They would still be in our minds and in our lives. Um, I, and I think some people want to live them. And for those people who are struggling with them, it's, it depends where you live and what your community of support is. But nobody makes a, 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 a transformation without some sense of um, being supported by a community. That's, that's, that's how... That's how, we, that's how we can make changes and still thrive in the world and, and without being isolated or um, uh, um, in, a, in a state of suffering. You know, there's, there's one other thing I guess I would want to say is that I bet if we asked everybody here, do you think it's right if there are people in your school, kids in your school, who live with... Um, shame and fear because of how they experience their gender or how they present their gender or how they experience their sexuality or how they present their sexuality, you would probably say, no, they should not live with shame and fear. It's not right that anybody in the schools you go to live in shame and fear. I mean, we accept that, I think, for the most part, that that's, that's not good. If there's shame and fear in educational institutions, that shouldn't be happening. We should be addressing that. We should be making a community in which no one feels that shame and fear. And when we talk about, you know, entering discussions of gender and sexuality into the school, I mean, in a way, we replace fear with knowledge. We, uh, we produce a supportive community so people don't have to live with a sense of isolation um, or a fear of people finding out who they are or what they feel or or what, what, the, what they want for their lives. Um, so so it's, it's just a couple of steps from there. It's, it, sh it shouldn't be that hard. En relació a això que diu Juïta, vull fer una pregunta, perquè abans has passat com ràpid sobre això, però crec que és molt important. Clar, tu el que estàs plantejant és que tots estem d'acord amb que no volem que ningú vagi a l'institut passant-ho malament i sentint por. Això estem d'acord. Però aquests passos que falten, Abans has dit, bueno, és que a vegades, per què aquesta gent rep rebuig? Per què un noi molt femení o que li agrada molt ballar? O per què rep rebuig? Doncs perquè hi ha altres nois que, bueno, els està posant en qüestió la seva pròpia masculinitat. No? Llavors, no és només si ens sembla bé o malament que la gent passi por o no, sinó que el segon pas que haurem de fer és relaxar-nos una mica, és relaxar-nos amb la masculinitat. És, o sigui que no és només una qüestió de si em sembla bé o malament, sinó que jo també hauré de canviar coses meves per estar més relaxat. Llavors, en relació a aquest segon pas, que té molt a veure amb, en general, més aviat els nois que les noies, com es relaxen una mica no? de, de tota aquesta cosa que és a vegades una mica pesada de demostrar tot el rat que soc un noi perquè no soc una noia, perquè no soc femení, perquè no soc marica, que és molt pesat. Com fem perquè aquests nois es relaxin una mica? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm not sure we can make anyone relax exactly, but um, but you know, I think uh, I think at a certain point, um, some people think they must be homophobic in order to show that they're heterosexual. But the fact is, you can be heterosexual and you can be confident of your heterosexuality and also accept homosexuality. You can accept gay, lesbian, bisexual lives. It, does, it doesn't have to threaten you if other people are living a life that you are not living, if the life you are living is one that you feel confident about. The more confident you are in your own heterosexuality, the more generous you can be about everybody else's sexual orientation. It doesn't matter that that person is gay. It doesn't reflect on me. It doesn't threaten me. I'm over here. That person's over here. We're part of the grand variety of human sexuality. You know, I had a, a woman come to me. Um, she was a very religious person, and she, um, she told me that she was going to pray for me. And I said, why? <laughs> and she said, because um, you don't accept the Bible. The Bible says that God created man and God created woman. And I said, and, and she said, you know, what you write is against nature. I said, so which is it? Is it the Bible 
that says there's man and woman, or is it nature that gives us the two sexes? And, and she said, um, she says, it's nature because nature expresses God's will. It's like, okay, complicated theory. Um, a little bit 17th century, if I'm correct. Um, <laughs> but um, I said, but nature has variation in it. Nature is marked by variability. Sexuality is marked by variation. There aren't just two options. There, there are many, many different permutations. That's part of what it is to be human, it is, is that there are these variations. We don't just come in two types, like, oh, your gender is this, your sexuality is this, we know what that is. There, there, you can be very masculine and very gay. You can be very feminine and very lesbian. You can be very masculine and very lesbian. You can be sort of masculine, sort of not, and be bisexual depending on who you love, right? I mean, goodness. This is the complexity of human life. So why be afraid that human life is complex in this way? It doesn't, it doesn't threaten your place, if you know your place, if you're at peace with your place. But if you don't know, and you think if somebody else makes that choice, it affects you, or it's contagious in some way, then you will be violent towards that person because you'll have to suppress that possibility because you don't want to think about it in yourself. Also, you know, we can say, well, I thought about um, lesbian sexuality, but I think it just doesn't work for me. It's, it's not who I am, it's not what I want. Um, but I'm very clearly against homophobia, and I support my gay and lesbian friends, right? In other words, it's thinkable. I mean, I can think about it. It's, it, is for, it might be for me. It's definitely not for me. But even if it's definitely not for me, that doesn't mean I have to be phobic, right? It's not for me, but I'm not going to be phobic. Because what somebody else chooses does not affect your pathway, which may well be a, a radically different one and equally worthy of respect, right? And, 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 and straight gender conforming people are as equally worthy of respect as anybody else on the spectrum. But if we start to think of it as a spectrum and as an enormous variability and as something that's also changing in time, in history, in culture, different possibilities become um, uh, available to us in different languages for understanding who we are and what we want, um, then we're living in a dynamic time and we have a lot to learn from one another. We shouldn't be frightened of each other's choices, of each other's desires. Seems like a bad way to live in the world when you're fearful of someone else's desire. Sarim, volve. Sí, sí. ¿Qué hago aquí? Ya la sé como lo Vale. La intentaré en, en anglès. Molt bé. Potser guanyes uh, punts per l'examen i tot. Uh, in your theory of performative gender, the gender is performed, that it means uh, is built. So does that happen the same with sex? And in which way uh, is the difference between the gender and the sex? Thanks. Well, you know, um, how we determine the sex of an infant um, seems on the face of it to be very um, straightforward. You check to see what the primary sexual characteristics are, you identify them, and you check a box in, in the hospital or on the legal form. Um, but in fact, the determination of sex in humans and actually in any number of organisms, usually involve several factors. And because about 10% of the human population is variable, it has an extra Y chromosome, it has a, an extra X or a broken X, there, there, are, um, there, there are many problems in making a definite um, uh, uh, attribution of sex um, in those cases. So, for instance, um, the Olympic runner, Kastor Semenya, from Kenya, I believe, um, there was a big question, can Kastor Semenya um, compete in women's 
uh, uh, racing um, uh, because there was some question whether Castor Semenya was a man or a woman. Now, Castor Semenya didn't obviously have primary sexual characteristics that were male, and yet people were sort of suspicious for various reasons. And um, they had to bring in, and an, they had seven different people deciding this person's sex. Endocrinologists, geneticists, psychologists, um, uh, biologists, physiologists, right? They, law, law, there are legal standards as well. So there are all these different standards that come in. And historically, even science has used different paradigms. So I don't think sex is performative in that sense, but I think that sex is something that, um, uh, that is interpreted differently depending on the framework, even the medical or the scientific or the legal framework within which we are, we're, we're, we're looking at it. Some, and and if, it's, if it's endocrinological, that is to say, if it's about hormones, you can't see that when the, when the kid is born. You can't see that. You have to test for that. Same with genetics. So, you know, it's a complicated affair. It's not a simple fact. It's a fact that has to be determined, and every time it's determined, it's determined within a, within a set of frameworks that are sometimes in contest with one another. See, I, I make things complicated. Hola. <laughs> Yo quería preguntarte que desde siempre hi ha hagut eh, conflictos a partir del género y se han justificado cosas a, a, a partir del género, tipo, eh, donde se ha de pagar más a l'home eh, de diners, lógicamente, eh, que a una dona, o las dones no pueden trabajar, no pueden sortir de casa, y eso ha estat des desde los inicios de la humanidad. Llavors, ara mateix, al segle XXI, com podríem canviar nosaltres aquesta manera de veure la societat? Um, uh, you're certainly right that there have been inequalities, social and economic inequalities between men and women. Um, um, in many different cultures and, and throughout history. What's interesting is that it doesn't always take the same form in, in every period of history or in every culture that we might look at. What's also interesting is that um, uh, women have been given the task of taking care of the home and what's called reproductive work, which has for the most part been unpaid and also takes up part of their time so that they're not working full time. Um, so part of what has to happen is changes in, in what is called the, the gendered division of labor, where men and women equally enter the workplace, equally take care of um, the, the home, the household, um, and the reproduction of, um, of, of, of life. So um, my sense is that feminism has made great advances in the last couple of centuries. Uh, women continue to get the right to vote. Women continue to enter into all kinds of professions. Um, it's especially true for minority women who um, uh, I think we, we have to be able to look and see whether when we talk about women, whether we're talking about women who belong to the dominant classes or the dominant races in a particular society, and what about other women who are more peripheral, peripheral who belong to religious minorities or racial minorities. I mean, all of this needs to be part of the picture. But there are advances, and sometimes then there's a setback, and then there are advances again and a setback. But um, there's, there is progress. Um, it's just not constant, and it's, it's not without reversals. So um, there's nothing in our natures, in the nature of a woman that makes her inferior to a man. 
Um, there's nothing in the nature of a man that makes him more dominant than a woman. And even if we think about physical strength, those are just statistics. Those are just statistics, because there are a lot of women who could dominate a lot of men, and we know that. Um, so it's not true of the entire group. It's just a, a statistical probability. Um, but there's nothing in nature that, um, that implies that men should be dominant in society. And because it is social, it's, it's something we can struggle to change. And it's something that we have struggled to change. And we've made enormous changes. It continues today. It's continuing right, right now in Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's continuing right now with the Me Too movement. It's consider continuing right now with the, um, with the extraordinary explosion of feminist um, activism throughout Latin America with the Ni Una Menos um, movement. So, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, bet that um, masculine domination is a universal that will continue throughout all of history. It might continue to be a struggle to defeat it, <laughs> um, but that's not the same as it's um, as saying that it it will triumph. I don't. I don't think. I think it's become weaker over time, even though. Um, uh, that that depends on where we look. I mean, the heads of government right now and their their war making ways make us think that the worst versions of masculinity are in power, but hopefully they won't last for long. Please. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi. I wanted to ask a bit of a personal question. Uh, if you don't want to, you can you can answer. Oh, so earlier on, you mentioned that uh, your personal experience is that you aren't exactly happy with your gender, but still you haven't changed it. So I wanted to ask, what is your experience? What's your story? And how did you come to write these many books? And uh, uh, how did you come to think about the theories? What was the point that made you think of it? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I don't need that to speak. Um. <laughs> no, 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 it's great. There are many ways to answer. I'm just trying to think of the best one. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, when I was young, um, and my mother um, was going to take me to school, she would say, hold on one moment, I have to put on my face. I have to put on my face, right? And I thought, but you, your face is already on. Uh, and w what does it mean to put on a face? You, this is your face. You, you come with a face. Um, she's like, no, 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 we cannot go outside without my putting on my face. So I would go, and I would stand next to her at the mirror, and then the face would come on. Right, the face would come on, and I saw um, that she was putting on a face that was very much like um, the Hollywood uh, um, stars that um, uh, were, were in the movies at that point. And um, in fact, um, uh, I saw that she had an idea of what she should look like, and she was trying to uh, perform and realize that idea, and it, it sort of worked with her. I mean, she could, you know, pull it off. She looked good. That was very good, excellent <laughs> makeup job. <laughs> uh, but I also saw that there was a kind of she was living with an ideal of what she should look like, and many women at the time were also trying to conform to this ideal, and some of them could conform more or less well, and some of them not at all. Um, uh, but if you didn't try to conform, then there was something sad or abject or unattractive. And, um, and so I decided that I needed to understand um, how gender was um, appropriated, how, how people live very often in relationship to an ideal of what they should embody. 
and how there's a certain failure built into that process. Nobody quite uh, realizes the ideal they have in their mind, which is why I said maybe nobody is a full boy. Like, what's the idea of a full, real boy? Like, maybe nobody uh, embodies that ideal perfectly. Maybe everybody fails a little bit here and there, and that makes gender kind of interesting. Um, I wouldn't say, well, I don't know what my gender is. I mean, I'm always surprised when somebody refers to me as a woman, or, um, or and that's okay. I mean, I don't mind, um, and I don't mind being called sir on the street either. That's not an insult to me. It's just part of what happens. Um, I think maybe I'm between, and that I'm not looking for a new category. I'm, I, I find my, my freedom and my well-being in the interstice, in the, in the middle, in the between, and that that's, that's okay with me. Um, of course, you know, if I'm in a feminist debate and somebody wants me to say, well, as a woman, I believe that we should have equality, I will say, as a woman, I believe <laughs> we <laughs> should have equality, but I don't really feel it in my heart. <laughs> but I'll say it for political reasons, you know, that's not a problem for me. Um, I, I think trans is really interesting to me. Um, uh, there are, of course, different ways of talking about trans and thinking about trans, and uh, Mikhail here is, would be the better person to talk about that. I, I find that some trans people um, really feel that they, they really want to leave the one gender and become the other, um, and then other trans people are experimenting with gender. They might be called gender queer, or they might be understood as trying to find their own way. Um, trans is a transition, but sometimes it's a transition that never stops. It's a life of, of change or of, of transitioning, of transformation. And other times people arrive and they're very happy where they arrive and that's where they want to stay. So even within trans, we get a wide variety of, of positions. Some of them are a little closer to me. I feel a kind of affiliation, uh, kinship. Um, but that's good. I, I'm not interested in having an identity. I'm interested in, in having affiliations. It, it's a less lonely way to live. Per allà dalt n'hi havia una altra. I després... Ah, no, sí, sí. Eh, la meva pregunta és... Quins són els límits entre ser un home i ser una dona i qui és l'encarregat de determinar-los? That's a good question. Do you want to take this? No, no, crec que crec que només el fet de fer-te aquesta pregunta ja és quasi la resposta. Perquè si ser un home i una dona és una cosa que algú ha hagut de limitar, vol dir que no és molt natural, no? Si tota l'estona, si sí, si sí, tot el rat hem de fer veure que és tan diferent, que és tan diferent, és perquè si deixéssim fluir no seria molt diferent. Jo, per exemple, tinc una, una persona molt propera que treballa en una botiga de roba per nens i nenes petits. No? I sempre explica que quan els nens arriben a la botiga, sobretot els nens, eh, se'n van directament a la roba de nena perquè és més brillant, perquè els molt petits. No? Encara no els hi han ensenyat que això no s'ha de fer. Llavors van, la toquen i les mares una mica, bueno, ves ràpido, no, jo vull això, i entonces el tul, el no sé quantos, la purpurina, i clar, totes les històries acaben amb que les mares s'enfaden molt i els diuen, bueno, un rato vale, però ara hem de comprar la roba per anar a l'escola. Llavors és que no és aquesta. Llavors ella sempre diu, clar, si nosaltres no separéssim les botigues de roba infantil per nen i nena, Molts nens i nenes es vestirien de forma diferent. Per tant, perquè no ho facin, hem de posar molt esforç i ho hem de separar. Aquí és on es veu que hi ha un problema, perquè efectivament estem limitant la llibertat d'aquestes persones per triar. Llavors, sigui qui sigui qui ha decidit els límits entre els homes i les dones, la pregunta és, estem disposats a seguir-los? Per mi seria més això, no? Mm. Mm. I think, I think the, the, the the line that separates men from women, depending in which context we are considering this, it's always breaking down, right? I mean, you know, name anything that is typically masculine. Like, well, what about strength? Well, what about women's strength? What about strength that, is the strength masculine? 
or is the strength feminine, or is strength something that men and women both have or do not have? Um, um, uh, there's nothing gendered about strength itself, right? It becomes gendered when we assume that men are the ones who are strong. Um, and, and we efface the strength of women, and they may well efface their own strength in order to comply. Right? But the truth is that strength itself is indifferent to gender. It doesn't care about gender. <laughs> okay. Or even beauty, right? There are a lot of beautiful men. There are a lot of men you would not call handsome, you would just call them beautiful. Right? Now, does that make them feminine? Or does that mean that beauty actually couldn't care less about gender? Right? Beauty crosses gender. You know, we make women beautiful and men handsome, but maybe some woman is just really handsome. <laughs> right? And han maybe handsome actually doesn't know anything about gender either. Right? So I don't know. You know, there are two different views. Maybe if she's handsome, she's masculine. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe women can be feminine and handsome. Maybe men can be weak and beautiful, right? I mean, as we start to think about those combinations, we realize that a lot of people will live more easily, <laughs> right? They breathe more easily in a world in which we accept complications like that. So we should ask ourselves, what are the terms that tend to draw the line? And are those terms really gendered? Or do we make them gender, just like the clothes? Ens queda poc temps, però podríeu aixecar la mà a la gent que voleu parlar? Vale, tothom no serà, val? Llavors, agafarem tres torns més. Sí, sí, i després agafarem... Vale, dos torns més. Vale. Fes, fes. Hola. 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 Et sentim, et sentim. Perfecte. Eh, com és que hi ha homes i dones que, o sigui, no estan a favor del feminisme o no el recolzen quan el que vol el feminisme és la igualtat de, de gènere? I també, per què creus que hi ha noies que defensen el feminisme però a la vegada, o sigui, veuen malament que els homes no, no puguin defensar? Well, I think there are some profound fears about feminism. I think some men fear feminism because they think that women will, um, will take their place at work um, or that women will cease to be feminine, cease, women will cease to want to please them. Um, women will cease to be subordinate in the household. Um, so they want women to be distinctly feminine, but they also want them to be distinctly subordinate. And, um, and they like that organization of life. Um, and they fear equality um, for many reasons, but mainly because it would mean the loss of dominance. And unfortunately, many people, men and women, prefer dominance rather than equality. And for some women, they prefer subordination rather than equality. They, they, they prefer to stay in their subordinated place because it gives them, it gives them safety, it gives them uh, a particular role they know how to occupy, it allows them <clears throat> to support their men and to rely on their men economically. So um, I'm, very, I'm always surprised at the deep resistance to equality that people have, both men and women. It, you'd think everybody would just want equality, but actually they really don't. Um, they, have, they have big stakes in dominance. Um, I mean, what surprises me more are the women who don't like feminism, who think that they will um, be pushed into work or lose their femininity or 
um, that the traditional household will fall apart in ways that they don't want to happen, um, or, or that they will become uh, somehow unattractive within their heterosexual world. Um, but in fact, that's not true. I mean, you could still be in a traditional household, you could still be a very, very feminine woman, and you could be a, a feminist who believes in, in the equality of the sexes and equal pay for equal work. That's, that's not a contradiction. People imagine that it is, but it's actually not. Um, jo penso que això dels moviments del LGTBI està molt bé i hi ha bastanta gent que ho apoya, però clar, després, jo, en la meva opinió, és com que aquesta diferència que hi ha de cultures en tots els països dificulta encara més aquest moviment. Llavors, um, si hi ha, per exemple, quatre països que canvien aquesta opinió i fan que el món ho vegi d'una altra forma, si les altres cultures eh, no canvien el punt de vista, serà difícil que sigui la igualtat en tot arreu. Um, did, did you want to say anything? Uh, <laughs> bona sort. Um, you know, um, Sometimes people mean very different things by equality, too. Uh, but uh, coming from the United States, I'm aware that sometimes our LGBT organizations, um, they decide what the main um, goals of the movement are. So gay marriage, um, uh, access to reproductive technology, or um, adoption rights, and they decide like what the what the main goals are, and then they arrive in North Africa or the Middle East or Turkey, and you know, saying, "Oh, we've come to liberate you," and <laughs> people say, "No, thank you. Uh, don't bring us another McDonald's, please." <laughs> um, and um, <laughs> and I think um, and and the problem with that is that a set of priorities that becomes important in one part of the world may not be the same priorities in another part of the world. The Turkish feminists are working, they have their own organizations. The LGBT organizations there, they certainly draw on international organizations, um, but they have a very specific problem of violence against um, trans people in urban centers, for instance, and they're working with their um, with their communities and their police and their social services and their politicians to figure out how best to do that. But they don't want the United States to come in and say, this is how you do it. And, and I certainly don't blame them. Um, but I think uh, that these struggles take different forms and the more we accept that, um, the more we'll understand why certain things become possible in South Africa, right? which has the most progressive LGBT provision of any constitution in the world. Okay, that's South Africa. That's not the middle of Europe. That's not the United States. The United States would never have that provision. The United States will remain behind in relationship to South Africa. Or the gender identity law in Argentina, which I think is still happening, that's more progressive than anything we find in Europe or the United States. So sometimes the progress actually happens outside of the Western Center in bits and pieces, and then, and then we catch up, and other times people are engaged in struggles that, that, that on their own historical time and through their own, their own form of struggle. So I'm not sure how, how we can compare these things, but um, uh, we just need to be careful not to impose one set of cultural norms on another situation, at least, especially if we're American, which, because we do it all the time. Agafem la última, la última pregunta. Hello, so 
Uh, it was nice to meet you. I really enjoyed this conference. And since I've studied your um, the, what, <laughs> your, your like work about gender, I was I was wondering how you will introduce like a newborn person. Uh, if you don't say it's a boy, it's a girl, you have to uh, give a name and introduce it, uh, him or her to society. How you do it then? Thank you. Well, it is true um, that some people have suggested, like the, the French feminist, uh, lesbian feminist, um, Monique Vitigue, that we do not, uh, we get rid of sex assignment altogether and that we start getting hospitals to refuse to assign sex and all of that. I'm less interested in that as a solution, although it's interesting, but maybe it belongs to science fiction or utopian philosophy or something. Um, what I think is that, um, uh, yes, you assign a sex, but the assignment of a sex is provisional. The assignment of a sex is provisional. And what if we brought children into the world, we give them the sex and the name, but we also raise them in a way that they're allowed to experiment and to find what they love and what they need and what they require for themselves. And they're given a chance to rethink the name, to rethink the sex as part of their lives. And they might say, I don't need to rethink any of that. I'm fine. I like the sex. I like the name. Thank you very much. But why shouldn't there be forms of gender experimentation, or even thinking much more openly about sexuality. That's part of child rearing and even part of primary and secondary education, so that people know that this is a zone where they can make decisions if they choose to, um, and that that's part of what they're being invited to think about and consider in the course of a life. So my point would be to focus on um, early childhood formation and care, schooling, uh, playgrounds. Um, what are the sites in which children are, uh, are encouraged or supported to think uh, creatively uh, or experimentally about what their sex is, what their sexuality is presumed to be, what their name is, how they feel about it, and how they want to live in this world? Um, we. We, re we, we, we receive so much from those who, who care for us, but at a certain point, we start to find our own way and we start to make decisions for ourselves and nothing could be more important at that point than to have the support of parents and schools and community. Molt bé. Bueno, ens ha deixat per pensar moltes coses. Moltíssimes gràcies, Judith Butler, per gràcies. contestar totes aquestes preguntes. Gràcies a vosaltres també. I de pas, que que tota aquesta eufòria, diguéssim, aquesta eufòria col·lectiva, no sé si és col·lectiva, que marxeu d'aquí pensant com tot això vosaltres us ho emporteu a l'institut amb el grup d'amics i amigues, als espais on sortiu de festa, que no es quedi aquí, sinó que ens ajudi a transformar-ho, però evidentment amb la vostra participació molt activa. Moltes gràcies. Gràcies.